Hey, this is David Sampson, host of Nothing Personal with David Sampson. Do you know who Eddie Mata is? Well, I didn't either, but now I do. He's got the best damn show in all of the internet. Find him on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. He's live all the time. He imitates people. He gets class A, B, C, D, E, and F celebrities, and he gets them to do things and say things they would otherwise never do. It's Eddie Mata. Go get him now. Well, here we have it. The man of the hour. He's been in the baseball business for over three decades. And now he has a podcast called Nothing Personal with David Sampson. Please welcome former Florida slash Miami Marlins president David, the good-looking bastard that he is, Sampson. How are you, baby? When you say three decades, are you saying 99 is the 90s decade? <laughs> then all through the 2000s, 2010, that's a decade. And then from 10 to 17, that's another decade. So that's like three decades. Is that what we're going to go with? Well, you technically you were involved in three decades. Think about it. 90s, <laughs> 2000, 2010. So, yes. <laughs> but I think I, I mean, I'm, I'm changing my entire profile, my entire resume. I have now been in baseball for three decades. Hey, George Brett did it. So did you. <laughs> There's a bunch of players, like football players, when they're playing when they're 65, and then they started, like, one game in 1969. They played in the 70s, 80s, and then 91, and they get to say they played in four decades. So I'm totally agreeing with your math. Well, there you go, my man. I mean, you went to Wisconsin for a reason, right? They taught you well. Two plus two is always four. Always. Don't try to make it five. And you can always get... Four beers for the price of one at any bar on State mm -hmm. Street every day that ends with Y. <laughs> Dave, man, I knew you were going to be a funny guy, man. Manny Cologne told me, listen, you're going to love this guy. I was like, I know, I could tell. So, David, let me ask you this. Let, let's, let's turn back the clock a little bit. When you were growing up, I feel like looking at your pictures, were you this competitor like you were like... I'm going to win. I play to win. And I don't care if these guys are bigger than me. Was that you when you were a kid? So you have to know that I'm 5'5". Five five and I've always been small. I'm pretty sure that my mother smoked throughout my entire pregnancy. There's a chance that when I was born, I was dropped on my head. All of those things are possible. Oh, okay. I just know that I was never going to be in the NBA, no matter how much I practiced. And I would go to school. And for whatever reason, I was born with this mouth. And I started talking young. I started being sarcastic. I was the class clown because this was before people were diagnosed with ADHD. I just got kicked out of class all the time because I couldn't sit in class for 40 minutes or 50 minutes or an hour. It made me insane. So I would crack a joke. I'd be loud. We didn't have phones or computers, so I would be passing notes or making paper airplanes. It was so bad that my parents, and this is true, and it this just came out in a recent article, but my parents paid me not to talk at the dinner table. That's how much I talked. And so I always loved sports, always wanted to play sports, and I always had a chip on my shoulder because everyone was taller than I was, and everyone assumed that I would be bad at sports. So I decided that I was gonna be good at every sport because I was gonna be great at no sports. So I would learn how to play all sorts of different sports. And my parents sent me to a special summer camp, not the kind you're thinking of. It was a sports camp where it was a three week competition in ping pong, in darts, in basketball, in baseball, in running, in jumping. It was like not even a decathlon. It's a decathlon on steroids. And I went to this camp, I was the smallest kid. Everyone's making fun of me, bullying me. What are you doing here? Oh, you had nothing else to do this summer. I still have the trophy because I won the overall competition because I couldn't win first place in any of the events, but I was good at all of them. And that's sort of been the story of my life. I know a little about a lot of things.
So you you were like, I don't care. I, I'm going to compete. That's how it was, right? Well, I did that in my business life too. When I started a business out of law school, it was a business that had never been done, selling newspapers in Europe same day. And the way that I got that business started was by being so aggressive and doing things so out of the ordinary. True story, to cut a deal with the New York Times, mm -hmm. I needed to get the publisher, his name was Arthur Salzberger, I needed him to get me newspapers early on a Saturday night to get to Europe on a Sunday. I couldn't get a meeting with him. I tried back then, you tried with letters, you tried with the phone. There's no emailing or texting or anything like that. I didn't know anyone who knew him. I went to the New York Times office and I did a walk-in meeting and he would not see me. So then I went back to my apartment and I wrote a letter explaining my business. I got dressed in shorts and a t-shirt and a shoulder bag. And I went back to the New York Times building. I went to the mail room and I pretended I was one of those bicycle messengers delivering a letter and I said, and I looked for someone who was older, who looked nice. And I said, my job is on the line. My boss needs Mr. Salzberger to get this letter. Is there any way you could make sure you get it to him or else I'm gonna be fired. And I look like a schlep and et cetera. Meanwhile, I graduated law school, was married, et cetera. Uh, the next day I got a call from the VP of circulation of the New York Times. And that was the beginning of my first business called News Travels Fast. So I've always been someone who doesn't accept no uh, in, in most circumstances. Personally, no means no, and right. I guess that's true. But in business, hell no, there is no no. Wow, David, I think that with your performance, with the t-shirt and the shorts, how come acting wasn't involved? <laughs> So I always wanted to be an actor and I did act in high school plays mm -hmm. and I acted in plays in grade school, high school. I co-wrote a play with my cousin that I performed in for charity, which is a whole nother funny story. And then I was in a real play where I tried out in 2014 to be in a, a real full feature play. And I won the part of playing Lorne Michaels in a play called Not Ready for Prime Time. And I walked into the first rehearsal and all these professional actors looked at me because I was the president of the Marlins at the time. They looked at me and said, what are you doing here? Like, this is a joke, right? Because they were taking it very seriously because it's a real play. And guess what? I knew my lines and I worked my ass off. And that play ended up performing in front of sold out crowds for the 24 performances we did. And I absolutely loved it. Wow, Dave. I mean, I hope a lot of young kids are listening to this because right now when they hear no, oh my God, I give up, that's it. But you, you're like a tiger. You're going, I'm going to go, go after it. Well, we don't let kids hear no anymore, right? It's the participation right. trophy. It's something that I was totally against. When my kids yeah. played Little League, uh, I always, everyone, I was president of a team. And so all these parents were handing me DVDs of their kids playing baseball. Hey, do you think you could give this to your scouts? Or, hey, do you think my son's good enough? And I'd say, no, he's not. There's no oh. chance he's gonna be a pro player. Let him have fun. But these parents are yelling at their kids. The kids are swinging and looking at their parents saying, are you mad? Is everything okay? And then our team finishes in last place and every kid gets a trophy and a pat on the back. I did not like that. If you lose, you're a loser and you've lost work harder to win next time, but be realistic with what you can achieve and then go for it. And when you get there, go more and go more and go more. No, oh, I totally agree because I, I say that right now. I'm like, I disagree with this. Anybody deserves a trophy bullshit because why? Learn from your mistakes and move on. You think Tom Brady winning all these Super Bowls, you think he feels sorry for the opponents? Are what Tom Brady me? and Michael Jordan have in common is they have this kill attitude that they don't want to beat you by a touchdown or by 10 points. They want to crush your spirit. They want to stomp on you until you're dead. And then they want to keep stepping on you until you break up. Like when you kill a bug on the street and then you mm -hmm. just play around with it to separate it into 49 different parts. That's what a killer instinct means. And if you want to be a winner in this world, however you define it, if you want to define it by money, by status, by social life, whatever you define winning as, Charlie Sheen may have his own definition, 
You have to do more than everyone else. You have to work harder than everyone else. And when everyone else stops, that's when you have to just start. Totally agree. David, how did you get involved in baseball operations? Like, how did it happen? Did you, with Jeffrey Laurie, the own, previous owner for the Miami Marlins, I could say Florida Marlins too, um, what was the relationship? Uh, he called me on the phone and said, hey, I'm your stepfather. Do you want to help me buy the Montreal Expos? And I said, hey, Jeffrey, I work at Morgan Stanley and I'm making a lot of money, but if you need help, I'll be happy to help. Here's my daily rate. And so he paid me and I worked with a banker and a lawyer and he bought the Montreal Expos. And then my fantastic Jewish mother got on the phone and said, hey, will you help him run the team for a few days? I said, sure, here's my daily rate. And so I moved to Montreal into a hotel thinking I'd be there temporarily. After one day, Jeffrey said, all right, head back to New York and Morgan Stanley, that's it. I said, no problem. And then I got a call saying, hey, I think I still need some more help. And I said, well, the type of help you're asking for is a full-time job. I'm gonna need a contract, I'm gonna need a lawyer, and I'm gonna need some guaranteed money that replaces the Morgan Stanley money because I'm not gonna be able to keep working at Morgan Stanley. And I signed an employment deal and I ended up working with him for 18 years. And year four of our partnership, he divorced my mother which created quite an interesting dynamic. But after that, he went from being my stepfather to and boss to just my boss. But we had a very good working relationship and we got a lot done. We got a lot done. Oh yeah, so you came in 2002 with the Florida Marlins, right? Yeah, we, we did, we sold the Expos. Jeffrey, I didn't own any part of it. Right. The Expos were gonna be contracted back in 2000 and 2001, along with either the Marlins or the Minnesota Twins. And Jeffrey wanted to stay in the game. So he asked me to put together a deal to buy another team. So we knew that John Henry didn't want to own the, the, the Florida Marlins anymore. He hated Florida. He couldn't get a ballpark built. He wanted to get out of there. He wanted to buy the California Angels. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with the idea, we'll sell the Expos to baseball so you can contract them, get rid of them. We'll buy the Marlins from John Henry and John Henry will buy the Angels. But it didn't work because we couldn't get a deal done with the Angels. And then the Red Sox were for sale. And we said, hey, John, how about buying the Red Sox? But the Red Sox had to be sold at an auction. But we made sure that John Henry got the Red Sox. So that was the franchise swap that happened in 2002. And that's the story of how the Red Sox ended up with John Henry winning all those World Series. The Marlins ended up with Jeffrey winning the World Series in 03. And the Expos ended up not being contracted, but moving to Washington and being bought by the learners and winning the World Series in 2019. So that franchise swap in 2002, all three teams involved have each won a World Series since then. Holy shit. Wow, that's, that's interesting. Right. That's a good trivia question for a baseball fan. That's a diehard fan. Okay, so here's my question, right? Now, you become the president of the Marlins in 2002. Was Andre Dawson... And Tony Perez, were they still there with, with Heisinger's uh, uh, administration? So they started, whether with Heisinger or Henry, they were certainly there under John Henry. Mm -hmm. When we got the Marlins, we got a list of all the employees. Right. And we inherited all these employees. And so I saw on the list Andre Dawson and Tony Perez. Of course, I knew who they were from being a child and loving sports. Walk into Pro Player Stadium. And one of the first meetings I said to my assistant was, I want to meet with Andre Dawson and Tony Perez. Because why wouldn't I want to meet Andre Dawson right, and Tony yeah. Perez? They come into the conference room. I say, well, what do you do for this team? And they said what they did. And I said, do you want to keep doing that? And they said, yes. And I said, great, you're in. And I ended up watching every home game from 2002 to 2017 with Andre Dawson and Tony Perez. Unbelievable. Wow. <clears throat> God bless I you. I don't have a cough mute button on this show. Don't worry about it. Be yourself. Be natural. All right? You're doing great. <laughs> all right. So now, but here's my thing, right? Look, I'm a diehard Yankee fan. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn and stuff like that. Now, I get with the Jeter situation, I know when, no, hold on a minute. 
when you call, when you're a new president and you come in, it's time to clean house, right? Is that how they do it? I mean, you became the president in 2002. Did you clean house? No, we took time to figure out who we had. Mm-hmm. And then we cleaned house one at a time by replacing people who were not good enough with people who we thought would be better in whatever positions there were, whether it was on the field or off the field. What Derek Jeter did is totally different. Derek Jeter overpaid in 2017 by about half a billion dollars when he bought the Marlins. Now, he used other people's money. Right. He'll let you know that he owns 4% and he'll let you know that he put in $25 million. What he won't let you know is that he signed an employment contract which paid him back the $25 million over five years. So it's really Bruce Sherman's money and a laundry list of other people. But he was so angry that the team overpaid, that his group of owners overpaid, and the reason he overpaid is he didn't want A-Rod to get the team, even though A-Rod never was gonna get the team, but I told Jeter that A-Rod was gonna get the team and they hate each other so much that the way we got the price up is we kept saying, hey, A-Rod, Derek's about to get the team. Hey, Derek, A-Rod's about to get the team. Bid more, bid more, bid more. And so Jeter came in angry and he got rid of everything that I touched. Every community initiative that I was a part of got eliminated. Every part of the design of the building and people mistakenly think that I'm bitter and they don't get it. I'm not bitter in the least, it's his team. I very well recognize that as president of a team for 18 years, You're merely holding a community asset and you're passing it on to the next one because after Derek, there'll be another one and then another one, but the team stays the same because we got a ballpark built. And I'm not upset if he changes the design, the colors, the logo, the players, the staff, none of it bothers me. The reason I talk about Derek on Nothing Personal, my show, is that he does things for the wrong reason. He wants so badly to get rid of anything that I touched, any picture of me in the ballpark, gone. That he will be laser focused on that. And you know what? Fans don't give a shit about that. They wanna win games. They don't wanna hear that the old owners stink. They don't wanna hear the farm system stinks. They don't wanna hear what a bad condition the team was in when I bought the team. They wanna see wins. So he literally, via text you and said goodbye no the way that happened is i got a text alert on my phone Mm -hmm. and the text alert said that uh david sampson has been fired as president of the marlins so i get that i i look at it i do a screenshot because it made me laugh i knew i wasn't going to work with jeter you know what he did during the entire sales process he called me to his house in tampa he brought me to his private club in new york and I want to work with you, David. If we get this team and if we get a deal done, you're so important to this organization. You've got institutional knowledge. And I knew he was full of it, but I played along. I said, oh, Derek, I really want to work with you so much. We can do so many great things. I could care less. I knew I wasn't going to keep the job. So I called him up and I said, hey, Derek, I just got a text. He said, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Yeah, we're going to move ahead without you. I said, Derek, let me just give you a few helpful hints here. When you're firing someone, you don't leak it to the media before you tell the person, trust me, I've done that. It's not a nice thing to do. Secondly, don't apologize to the person. Say, hey, David, we're going, we're moving on. Leave your key card on the desk. Bye-bye. And I'd say, thank you for your time, Mr. Jeter. And I move on. But Derek had no experience firing anyone before because he's a baseball player. So I got a call from Bruce Sherman afterwards who said, hey, thanks for helping out, Derek. Sorry, that was a little uncomfortable. I said, no problem. Good luck. See you later. And that was it. Wow. But he also got rid of Andre Dawson and Tony Perez. And Jeff Conine and Jack McKeon because those were my guys. Andre Dawson and Tony Perez are not my guys. They, were, they are Marlins institutions. Jack McKeon is not my guy. He is a World Series winning manager for the Marlins. Jeff Conine is not my guy. He's Mr. Marlin. Right. But, it, but when we came on, I said, hey, Andre and Tony, what were you making? All right, you're in. When you're dealing in millions of dollars and someone's making 75 grand or 80 grand, you don't even think about it. 
when you know you're going to get such terrible PR. Instead, what Jeter did is he said, hey, Andre and Tony, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you 25 grand. You can never go in the clubhouse. You'll never be in uniform. I always had them in uniform because they help the players. But you're not allowed to do any of that. And they said, piss off. And so they were gone. And that was a mistake. And that makes me sad because Andre and Tony and Jack and Jeff, they're, they're institutions for the Marlins. And now they've moved on to other things. Jack McKean works for the Nationals. Andre Dawson go, went back and works for the Cubs, I think. Tony, I do not believe, is with another team, which makes me sad. And uh, Conine is now an assistant hitting coach at a university in South Florida. But they should all be involved with the Marlins. But I think when Derek's done, which will be soon, uh, they'll all be hired back. Wait, so David, you're telling me Jeter told Andre Dawson and Tony Perez, you can't come in, inside the clubhouse and yeah. I'm only giving you 25000 for the year? Yes, sir. Make a few community appearances and just smile when we tell you to smile. It was insulting. And so they, they literally told him to screw off. Do you know that Andre Dawson did not go to the Hall of Fame induction when Derek was put into the Hall of Fame? And Andre's never missed an induction since he got into the Hall in 2010. And how upset Andre was to not go. But on principle alone, because he's a man of great principle, he was not going to be there and exchange smiles and watch Jeter get into that club. And where was Tony? Yeah, was he there? Tony did not go either. And is it because of Jeter? Holy Are we on shit. video? Are we recording this? Is oh, this, this is live? recorded. I, yeah, this is live right now. Twitter, it's live. Facebook live, you, you name it. But wow, I, I mean, I can't imagine because if I would, if I was the, you know, a percentage of, of the ownership, I would call you, say, hey, let's have lunch. Look, this is what we're going to do. I really appreciate what you did the previous years, but, you know, I'm going to go with with another another person. And that's it. I mean, I would be professional about that. I wouldn't just be like, text, sorry, whatever he did, you know. What, it's, story listen, is. I can't play shortstop. I can't. As much as I wish I could, I can't. I'm not a Hall of Fame player. Jeter's a Hall of Fame player. He's one of the top 10 shortstops of all time. Great championship caliber player who loved to win. And I give him all the credit in the world as a player. But that doesn't make you a good executive. It just doesn't. Now, could he get better? He's been there four years already. Notice now he no longer says, hey, we had a lot to clean up from that ownership group because people are saying to him, dude, it's been four years. Like, what are you talking about? You can't keep talking about the old regime anymore. Right, right. Holy shit. All right. So now, how do you got how'd you guys make money when you won the World Series in 03? Did you make money? Because no. all year long, I haven't seen no fans. And all of a sudden, September comes. Oh shit. Okay. You guys even sell out in the wild card game. Hold on. That's that is revisionist history. Go back and look at the attendance when we clinched the wild card in 2003, a pro player. There were 12,000 people in pro player when we clinched. The first game against the Giants after we were tied at one, pro player did not sell out. Game four of the division series sold out. And then LCS against the Cubs and World Series against the Yankees. All of a sudden there were 65,000 people and it was amazing. Our season tickets went up from 03 to 04, but not nearly enough. Our payroll was always too high because our owner wanted to win and we'd go for it in windows. And when we'd win, or if we didn't win, we'd bring it down like we did in 06, build it up again, try to win. You don't, break it down again in 09, build it up again to the crescendo in 2012 when we opened the new ballpark, didn't win, broke it down again in 13, build it up. So what the majority of teams have to do is they have to go up and down. You're building and then you're retooling and then you're building and retooling. Teams like the Dodgers and Yankees can be in perpetual build mode. They don't necessarily ever retool. But teams like the Rays are constantly having windows open and closed. And the best teams keep their winning window open the longest. And the Rays are the best at that in the game. We were not the best at that, but we tried. But it's harder than you think. When you guys won the World... Okay, so before that, 2003, I heard that it wasn't the traveling secretary telling you guys, hey, you guys should hire Jack McKean. Is that true? 
So we, Jeffrey wanted to fire Jeff. To, so this is a crazy Torber. story. Yeah, I want the story. Come on, David, open up. This is crazy. When Jeffrey bought the Expos, he had had a relationship with Jeff Torborg. Jeff Torborg was a uh, manager of the Mets. He was a catcher. Jeff Torborg had done some personal things with Jeffrey off the field, helping his nephew uh, with, with coaching, et cetera. Who cares? When Jeffrey got the Expos, the manager was a guy named Philippe Ballou, and he was a Montreal institution. But Jeffrey wanted to fire him from the first day. But we had to wait to lose a few games. So he lost a few games. He fires Philippe, brings in Torborg, who he had told he was bringing in anyway as soon as a few games were lost. So Torborg comes in, is the manager in the rest of 00 and 01. He comes with his sons. He, I mean, it was an absolute nightmare having him as manager for me, not for Jeffrey, but for me, because he was demanding and he, he, he had all these crazy requests. He thought he was the Beatles and we couldn't even win with him. But be that as it may, he had the ear of the owner and that's fine. We get into 2003 and all of a sudden Torborg, it's Wayne, his act is Wayne a little thin, even with Jeffrey. Larry Beinfest and I were way over him already. Couldn't wait for Jeffrey to get, get the message that Torborg needed to go. Who's gonna be the manager now? Bill Beck, the traveling secretary, who we inherited from the John Henry group, who we met with, much like we said, that's what you do is you meet with employees. And guess what? We liked him. He was the best traveling secretary we'd ever seen. And we'd only seen one, but we kept him and had this 15 year love affair with him. And in 2003, he goes to Jeffrey and says, you know, I'm very close with Jack McKean. We work together. He's not working right now. He may be just the manager for you. So Jeffrey calls him. Jack McKeon comes to Miami, meets with Jeffrey. Jeffrey loves him, says, we're hiring you. He fires Torborg, brings in McKeon. McKeon starts on a Sunday. He doesn't know one player on our roster, not one. We sit with him. We make the lineup for him. We say, here's the players. Here's who's good. Here's who's not. Figure it out from here. He said, you're not going to make the lineup every day. We said, no, you make the lineup. And he ended up being this lovable grandfather, brilliant strategist where everything went right. No three. And the rest is history. We won the world series because Jack made moves that the players didn't understand that we didn't understand, but every one of them worked. You see that picture right there? Yes. See That's that? me. That's me holding a world series trophy in Yankee stadium before the lights went out. Man, I was so angry at you guys. I, mean, I was like, bastard. Do you know that we were a better team than the Yankees that year? I'll tell you. I, I looked at the roster. You had Pudge, Golden Glove, Mike Lowell, Golden Glove, Louis Castillo, Golden Glove, Derek Lee, Golden Glove. You had Juan Pierre in center. I mean, you know, you guys How had... How about Alex Gonzalez? Alex Gonzalez, at yes. Short. At short, yes. I can totally... Yeah, he was great. Uh, no, don't worry. You're fine. Um, you had, and then you, you called up, uh, you know, you had this guy with the leg kick. I'm like, holy shit, I love his personality. And then you had, um, you know, this 19-year-old hitting bombs against the Yankees. And I was at Miami game three when he hit that bomb to right center. I was like, who's this 19-year-old killing my team? Do you know the story of Dontrell Willis? Go ahead, it's a me. good story. Because now, 20 years later... What happens in baseball is scouts and executives like myself, we say, man, we're so good at our job. We got Dontrell Willis. We knew he was going to be a star. Dontrell Willis was a throw in in a trade that we made with the Cubs where we traded before we even were president and owner of the Marlins for one day. We traded Matt Clement and Antonio Alfonseca to the Chicago Cubs. We did that because we had to lower the payroll. We got back some players, and I'm trying to remember who, but it doesn't matter. But we wanted for optics because we were new to the market, and we wanted to be able to go to the public and say, hey, I know we're trading some of the players you love, but we got three players back. 
And the Cubs said, we're not giving you three players because we're taking on money. We said, just throw in a guy. And the Cubs said, we got a guy. He's in low A. He's a lefty. And he's got a funky delivery. Not going to make it. Our scout said, he's nothing. He's not going to make it. He's not even a prospect. So the, the Cubs said, we'll put him in. We said, great, we'll take him. But we're going to tell people, hey, this guy was an important part of the trade. And then Dontrell Willis became Dontrell Willis when no one expected it. And then we got to say, oh, that was a critical part. We wouldn't have done that trade without Dontrell Willis. Holy shit, man. I love Dontrell, man. Even though he, he's the know, greatest. But you got, you had Dontrell, you had Carl Pavon, Pavano, which he sucked for the Yankees. Um, who else did you have? Um, Brad Penny. Brad Penny, stud. Mark yeah. Redman was in that Redman, rotation. Yeah. We had I mean, Uget Urbina, the convicted felon that we got at the trade deadline. <laughs> Here's another perfect baseball story for you. At the deadline in 03, we wanted to get a closer. Urbina was having a great year for Texas. We called up Texas, and they said, great, we'll trade you Urbina. We want one of your two top first basemen in your system. And we were pretty new to the system. And we had a guy named Jason Stokes and a guy named Adrian Gonzalez. Yeah. Wow. Our baseball people said they're both good. There's a good chance that they're both going to be major league players, but whatever. It's don't hold up the trade. Let them choose. <clears throat> so the Bless Rangers you. said, you know what? We'll take Adrian Gonzalez. And we said, no problem. We'll take Urbina. Meanwhile, Gonzalez ended up having an unbelievable career, yeah. but I would make that trade every day because we got the ring. You got the ring. Now, I want to know. I heard that Jeffrey flew in 125 employees for game six, four-star hotel. I mean, do, do owners do that? So they do it more now, but it wasn't common back then. Uh, the reason why we did that is we wanted to have the employees celebrate in something that we recognized at the time. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to get to a World Series. It's so hard to win a World Series that if there's an opportunity for an employee to be a part of that, how could you not let them? You're making a lifetime memory and you're gaining a lifetime of loyalty. Even if you fire them later, they will always have Paris. And that was our theory. And it was so amazing. And all of them got to go on the field after the game and they took pictures at home plate at Yankee Stadium. If there's a place to win, the Marlins were the last team to win a World Series on the field at old Yankee Stadium. It was the um, Florida Marlins of 03. Um, um, my pulmonary artery is cracking right now. You're going to save me, David? Shit. No, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going and tell you that the Yankees knew they were losing from the top of the first. I spoke to Joe Torre about this. But hold up. But we were when up 2 nothing, right? We were up 2 nothing in the series? No, absolutely not. You lost game one. Oh, that's right. We did lose game one, yes. And by the way, you were losing game one in the top of the first before 20,000 people even gotten into Yankee Stadium. They were so happy that Aaron Boone hit the home run that you beat the Red Sox. Yeah, we were high that You didn't pay attention to the fact that Juan Pierre got on base. He stole second. Castillo grounded him over to third base and punched in a sacrifice fly before people could get done taking a piss and get to their seat. The Yankees were up one nothing over David Wells in game one. Joe Torre knew that the Yankees had a problem because our team was just better. But we were the small market, low payroll against the big, bad New York Yankees. But you know what? When you look at the records and look at the players and the teams, we had the better team. Yeah, well, I can't say nothing about that. I mean, you guys beat us. <laughs> you know, fair and square. You know it was tied at one, and then you won game three to go up 2-1. And then we won three in a row to win the series 4-2. A little known fact about that Marlins team is we had to win three games in a row in all three series. We lost game one to the Giants, won the next three to win the series. We were down three to one to the Cubs, had to win three in a row to win the series. We did. And we were down two to one to the Yankees and had to win three in a row. And we did. Thank you, Jeff Weaver. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I'm going to kick your ass when I see you in New York in a friendly way. <laughs>
How do you kick someone's ass in a friendly way? Is it like with a noogie? It's you just, like you put you, them in a you, headlock with a you, noogie. You give you give them a hug and they say, you know what? You're still a great guy, but damn it! <laughs> I've gotten so many of those noogies because I'm so small and people want to beat the shit out of me. <laughs> but I've never been punched. I've never thrown a punch. Never gotten punched because I've always been able to talk them out of it. And I can squirm out of the headlock noogie, or I can just have big people around me help me. David, that game against the Cubs when the other Alex Gonzalez for the Cubs made that error, but also before that when Moises Alou was trying to catch a fly ball, do you think the baseball gods were with you that moment? They were with us the whole postseason. You know, we don't, in the industry, we don't criticize teams who don't win World Series the way the public does and the way the media does. Mm -hmm. Because to make it through October, you need a lot of two out duck farts that drive in runs. You need errors by players who normally don't make errors. We, to beat the Giants, Jose Cruz had an error in right field. He was a gold glover. He dropped the ball right. that helped us win a game. Alex Gonzalez made an error in game six with the Cubs. That was a double pay, play grounder. Game over. Series over. Yes. He made an error and we took advantage. And you need those little bits of luck to happen. Much like the way the Cubs won the World Series in 16. Mm -hmm. Remember that rain delay? Yeah, they were going to yeah. lose to Cleveland. The rain delay came. It changed the mojo. You need something like that to happen. And every team gets something like that. I always tell people the month of October a great team doesn't make great plays. They eliminate mistakes. How often do you see a great play? Here and there. But the base running mistakes, you cannot afford to do that, especially in October. You know, you got to make the plays, man. So we had a rule, 27 outs. 27 outs is what we are making the other team get from us. We are not giving one out away. It doesn't work all the time because you've right. got players who run into outs or players mm -hmm. who don't hustle or players who make errors. But it's 27 outs, no more. Don't give another team an ounce. Don't give them a chance. And when another team gives you a chance, you better take advantage of it or you're not going to win. And, you know, tonight's game, I don't know, are we, are we live? So this show yeah, ends yeah. today and that's the end of it? No, no, it's live, but um, it's it's on Facebook and Twitter live right now. You you'll see it. Uh, then I upload it on YouTube, but I'm gonna have to upload it real quick because I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because <laughs> go ahead, spill out your thoughts. But you don't understand, David. I watch a game like you watch the game. I watch it like I'm in the I'm in the dugout, like a manager. I'm looking at specific pitches. What are they trying to do with one and two count? What's the shift going on? Is this guy hot? I mean, I break it down like a maniac. People tell me you are a maniac when it comes to October. I tell all my girlfriends, leave me alone for the month of October. This is where it counts, baby. Hold on. Time out. I need a 20 right now. Go ahead. In what order do you tell your girlfriends? Mm -hmm. And which of the girlfriends do you not tell because you want some sort of visit after an 11th inning walk-off where your team loses? I don't really want them to see them for like a week, to be honest. I can't. I, Dave, you understand. We are spoiled as Yankee fans, man. We're, you know, we're used no, to you're not. Well, when I was growing up in the 90s, yeah. Yes. When I grew up, the Yankees stunk. Keep that in mind. From 1981 to 1996, the Yankees were awful. Then Steinbrenner gets suspended and they hire in Joe Torre. And then Cashman comes, and all of a sudden, they're great. But since 2009, it's been fine, but not great. And think about how many years that is now. That's why I think Cal Steinbrenner, if they lose tonight, and if you're watching this and the game's already happened, you can either fast forward or you can say, wow, they had it right. If the Yankees lose tonight, Steinbrenner's got to do something because that's 12 years. That means a kid who's in first grade is going to college next year, and they will not have seen the Yankees in a World Series to say nothing of winning a World Series. And that's not good. So the Steinbrenner family, now it's really Hal, he's gonna have to do something. If that means Boone, if that means Cashman, something's gotta give and it all starts with tonight. So if Evaldi has a good game and for whatever reason Cole doesn't because he doesn't find a way to get through his substance issue, that could be it for the Yankees. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> 
killing me. Okay, so what's your take tonight, David? What you, you tell me? I'm live on a show. I'll call you right back, okay? You tell him with Eddie Mata, baby. <laughs> I'm with Eddie Mata. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go on to CBS HQ, I think. Something must have happened. It's live. And I'm so focused on you. Normally, I spend the day. I'm on my phone. I'm looking to see what's happening. Are there big things? And guess what? I don't know what happened, but when they call, I got to be in the ready. So I sit here all day in my blazer. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have shorts on. You know, yeah, underwear too. is optional. Yeah. I have an earpiece that works almost all the time. I stick it in my ear. I speak into a microphone and I talk a bunch of crap. <laughs> but I did it for so many years and I've been through so much that for whatever reason, once in a while, my crib notes work out. I like the Yankees to win tonight. They were my pick of the day on my show, Nothing Personal, which is probably being released right now by Coca, our producer. I recorded it before we did this. I think the Yankees should win tonight. They the only to. concern you should have as a Yankee fan, if Cole does not pitch in the fifth inning, you have a real problem. And also, if the Yankees don't hit with two outs with men on base, it's going to be a real problem. That's a problem, but the Red Sox may not either. So runners in scoring position, it's good, but sometimes both teams can go 1 for 12 or 0 for 7. You really, it's, you really need your starting pitcher to give you some length uh, in this game if you're the Yankees, and that's Cole. Because remember, when the, if the Yankees win, Cole can't go until game three against Tampa. Right. So the Yankees and their lack of rotation depth is going to be the end of them. Even if they win tonight, I don't see how they beat the Rays. I'm really sorry. Come on, give me some luck, man. <laughs> I want them to win. <laughs> MLB wants them to win. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Dave, after the World Series, where'd you guys party in New York? How much was the mm -hmm. bill that night? Talk to me. Come on, open up with this. Went into uh, Jack McKeon's suite at the Hyatt Hotel in New York, and we watched Sports Center all night because we watched ourselves on Sports Center. While we were getting hammered, smoking cigars and anything else we could light up, there may have been other things, <laughs> having the time of our lives, not believing that we had just won a World Series and watching Sports Center on loop as the way it did back then through the middle of the night. That's what we did. Now, when we beat the Cubs, mm -hmm. a bunch of us went out in Chicago and wow, that was fun. We went to bars where people were despondent crying and we were there whooping it up and people were so pissed and I was so happy. <laughs> where, where did the players go uh, after? Uh, the players went out in New York. Uh, we got the stories the next day on the team charter. Uh, there was uh, there was some sex in the champagne room. There was some loving. There was some drinking. There was some vomiting. There was some partying. Uh, the players did it up as they should do. When you're 23 and World Series champion in New York, I would expect you to go out like your urban Oscar Meyer. Well, did they actually let you guys in, in New York City? God! Uh, New York's a business town, baby. Yeah, They're yeah. letting you in. They're buying you drinks because they want your picture and your autograph. Well, that's true. Okay, so 2003. But also, there's a story, too, because my boy Manny Cologne gave me some, you know, he was my resource of value because I love him. Um, you, you guys actually, that year... Did you, like, reroute the plane and said, we're going to Vegas because we're going to the West Coast, and it was an off day the next day, and you're like, fuck this, we're, we're going to Vegas for the night. Is that what happened? Tell me that story. So I love Vegas, mm -hmm. and the team was uh, doing well. We were sort of excited. There was a chance for maybe making the playoffs, and uh, we wanted to reward the players. And Jeffrey said, what should we do? And at the time, Larry Bonfest was the GM, and Larry and I loved going to Vegas. We had a rule. Anytime you're west of the Mississippi, for whatever reason, you're going to Vegas. And uh, we said, Jeffrey, how about bringing the players to Vegas? They'll love it. He said, what if some players don't gamble? I said, they'll find something to do. We're going to get them all rooms at the Bellagio. They can go nap if they want. But we're going to stop for like five or six hours on our way either to Arizona or from Arizona. I can't remember. And Jeffrey said, fine. But the road trip... We're only going if we have a winning road trip because it was the middle of the road trip. We were 0-6 and, and Vegas was about to get canceled. We had made the arrangements. We had buses in Vegas. We had In-N-Out Burger. We had suites ready to go. I had ready to go. 
everything's great. Jeffrey was like, we're not doing this. I said, we got to do it. You know what? This will be the spark that we need. And my nickname was Sparky given by Jack McKeon because I was the spark plug of the organization. So people call me Sparky. And so I said, Jeffrey, this is the spark that we need. And Jack said, come on, Sparky, let's do it. So we went to Vegas. The players all had a blast. They walked the strip. Some of them gambled. Some of them went to nightclubs. Some went to their rooms. Some went to eat. We got back on the plane. And then a few months later, we were hoisting the World Series trophy. Unbelievable. I mean, you know, th that's what I'm talking about. I love stories like that because that is being human. So it's funny. When you're the president of a team, if you start believing your own bullshit, if I can say that live, maybe I no, can. No, please. You, you, you can use whatever um, you want. I got a lot of profanity from well-established actors and athletes. Trust me. You're not the first. Eddie, I have a rule. And I had a lot of negative things written about me in my career. Mm -hmm. And I have very thick skin. But my rule was very simple. I don't believe when people write bad things about me because I know me and I know the truth. But the corollary to that rule is I don't believe when people write good things about me because I don't per permit myself to believe the good and ignore the bad because that makes me a douche. Right. And I'm a lot of things, but I'm not that. And so I never took myself too seriously. I knew I was in the entertainment business. I knew I was in the memory making business and I knew I wasn't curing cancer or splitting the atom. It's sports. Vegas, why not? Go out and party, why not? Try to relax a little, why not? Yeah. And you know what? We got a ring. And that's what you play for. That's the only thing. You, you now, play to get that ring, right? Money, one, ring, two. But you guys, did you guys make money off winning the World Series? Uh, As an organization, when it comes to money-wise. Revenue increased by about $25 million, mm -hmm. but our expenses increased by more. So yes, you do get more revenue when you win the World Series mm -hmm. and when you have a deep playoff run, but we were a losing organization. I ran a horseshoe organization. We lost money every year. I, we couldn't get fans in the stands. Uh, I, I couldn't get a naming rights deal done at Marlins Park. I couldn't get more season ticket holders at Marlins Park. I couldn't get a better deal with Wayne Huizinga or Steve Ross when they owned Dolphin Stadium and we were a tenant. So there were a few years that we made money in our books, but that money was used to pay off debt. Mm. That debt was accrued because we had a fund losses. So overall operating, we lost money. But I said to Jeffrey, write the check. Every year, write the check because I promise you, the value of your team is gonna go up by more than the amount of the check you are writing. So don't sell the team right now. Give me $20 million, have the payroll at 80, because next year your team will be worth way more than 20 million than it was worth this year. And I ended up being right. Jeffrey ended up selling the team for $1.2 billion on an enterprise value, which means he had to pay off debt after that. He didn't walk away with $1.2 billion. Right, right, right. People think that, but that's not how business works. You have to pay off your debts. And, uh, but he did, it was a very good business deal for him. And he got the pleasure of running a team for 18 seasons. So for those 18 seasons, my question is this, how can you convince the fans to come to your stadium down in Miami? Like, you know, you have, you figured the summertime, nothing's going on in Miami. You got Miami hurricanes, that's the fall, September. Um, but how can you tell fans, hey, come to the games? Are, is that rhetorical? Well, you, I mean, you Are get. you going to answer that question? Are you going to act as though I didn't spend 16 years of my life trying to answer that question? <laughs> that I didn't go to a million <laughs> rotary clubs, Kiwanis clubs, churches, synagogues, bar mitzvahs, chambers of commerce, luncheons, dinners, breakfasts, snacks, bars, begging, pleading, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large businesses, anybody, please buy tickets, come to games. Pretty please. Oh. 
Wow. Nothing. Never. It's impossible. And by the way, I thought it was just me. But Hyzinga couldn't sell tickets. Henry couldn't sell tickets. Samson couldn't sell tickets. Jeter can't sell tickets. So it's not our fault. The market is 0 for 4 right now. You know, I had a chance to caddy for Wayne Heisinger back in the days at Nantucket Golf Club. And, you know, we had a great conversation, you know. And I was like saying, listen, my man, did you make money off the World Series? like, fuck no, I lost money winning the World Series in 97. Like, he did. Really? I was like, wow. He did. So then here's the thing. I, I had a chance to meet Bruce Sherman, 2018. Yeah, I was sitting right there, right behind, because, you know, your boy Manny Cologne hooked me up with those gangster seats tickets at City Field. And so Sherman, you know, he's a New Yorker too, and he says, Eddie, well, what do you think? What should we do? I'm like, buddy, you got to move out of Miami. It's just that simple. He's like, really? I'm like, where would you move? I was like, why don't you go to Nashville? Why don't you look at Carolina? No one is coming to your games down in South Florida. It's facts. He's like... You know what I love about you New Yorkers? You tell it like it is. I'm like, well, it's the truth, isn't it? He goes, yeah, yeah, well, we'll work on things. I'm like, buddy, no offense. No one's coming to your games down in Miami. It's just that simple. Time out. <laughs> <clears throat> Are you telling your audience that you went to Wayne Heisinger and said, my man, that's what you said to Wayne Heisinger? I think I hey, did. Hey, my man. My man, listen, what happened? No, no, you didn't. No, you <laughs> I, I don't know. I was 22 at the time. I don't know what I told you him. You did not say, you said, Mr. Heisinga, is there a chance you'll talk to me? No, no, no. hold on. I was his Mr. caddy. I, I, was, I was his caddy, and everybody known, knows about me that I am a personality. I make these people laugh and everything. So Heisinga, love me. My man. My man, Wayne, come on. <laughs> Did you try that with Bruce? My man, Bruce, move that team. Did he tell you that because of that asshole Samson who signed an agreement with the public in Miami, the team can never move? We're there for 37 years. Why'd you do that? <laughs> Hold on, let me think. Wait for it. Oh, yeah, for $400 million of public funding. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> but come on, no one's going. Okay, so what would you do if you were, would you move or no? It's, that's like asking me, what would I do if I were 6'10"? Oh, you I'm mean not. That. True, true. So what, why would I even speculate? The Marlins can't move. Bruce Sherman spends zero time thinking about whether or not the team should move. What he's thinking about now is how much more money he's got to put into this team that loses money every year before he has to sell. And if he sells, can he get some other schnook to pay 1.2? That's all he's thinking about, not thinking about moving. Can't do it. I don't even dream about being 6'10". Do you know what I do do is I get the Nerf hoop and I lower the rim and I pretend I'm James Worthy. That you can do. Okay, so we do the type of guy like, you know, those adjustable hoops that little kids have and then like say, hey, take a picture of me dunking and reality, you know, the hoop's only like five feet. <laughs> is that you? <laughs> One hundo. <laughs> I had that thing bent so much. Remember the um, the basketball hoops that bend right at the elbow? Yeah. I bent it so much that you'd hear this right at the end. <laughs> like you were breaking the goddamn thing. I wanted it so low. It was the only way I could dunk. And I couldn't use a real basketball because I couldn't palm it with my hand. So I would take one of those um, inflatable small rubber basketballs mm -hmm. and I would dunk that shit like I was Dr. J. <laughs> Too funny. David, 2012, all right? Talk to me. You hired this guy in and out. <laughs> Come on, man. My man. My man, Ozzy Gian. All right, listen. All right. What was wrong with Ozzy? I, I kind of like his style, to be honest. He's straight up. I mean, what happened? He is straight up. We were screwed when we interviewed him, and he said, you're offering me a four-year deal? You sure, Poppy? <laughs> and he had already negotiated it with Jeffrey. There was no chance, no choice. We were giving him four years, and he looked at me and said, four years? <laughs> he was fired after one and paid for four. My man. Well, I think he stole that from you guys. <laughs> Listen, I, I give him credit. When I see him now, I give him a big hug and say, hey, one nothing, Ozzy. Ozzy would spend batting practice watching bullfighting in the clubhouse. He was totally disengaged, couldn't have given the first 
fuck. I love you, Ozzy, my man. But you didn't care. You know it. You were cashing in. Reinsdorf wanted to get rid of you. You knew it. Everyone told us, don't hire him. Don't hire him. But we did because we thought you'd be the difference maker. You would. You thought you would be the man. <laughs> the man. <laughs> what? So... Okay, so it's my worst year. It's my worst year in my career was 2012, and there's a lot of candidates for the podium. Trust me, but 12 is the worst. But you know, you you had a listen. You guys were on the rise, right? New stadium. You had you signed great players. You got a new manager that won the World Series with the White Sox. So you're saying, okay, you know, this could be a change. And do you see what's behind me? Yeah. That's the franchise on Showtime. That was we were that team in 2012. We had it all going on. We were the talk of baseball. Jeffrey Loria walked into a bar at 12:01 a.m. the first day of free agency, wearing a Reyes jersey to meet with Reyes, a Reyes Marlins jersey. Takes off his coat, and there's the Marlins arms jersey number seven. Reyes said, "That's great, Poppy. How about over a hundred million? No problem. Hey, I'm a Marlin. Great. We did it. Hey, Burley." We want you. Hey, you're going to have to give four years. No problem. Come on down. Hey, Heath Bell. Yeah, we don't need to meet with you. I don't need to meet with you. I don't need to see the stadium. Don't worry. Just give me three years guaranteed because I know I can't wipe my ass right now. So give me three years. No problem. Done. So we're thinking, man, we are set up. We go into spring training. We've got Stanton. We've got Burley. We've got Reyes. We've got Hanley. We've got Logan Morrison. We've got Gabby Sanchez. We have a new ballpark. It's glistening. There's no more rain delays. What could go wrong? I lost connection. Sorry. What was I talking about? I just <laughs> lost my. I just totally. You, I lost my place. You 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 had everything going for 2012. You signed these ball players. Everything mm. was going great. And then when did it hit? In July. What, what, I have Eddie. I'm sorry. I must not be hearing you. I have no recollection of 2012. Oh. I don't. Okay. I wasn't talking about 2012. No, I would never talk about a year where we had it all and then we were playing the Red Sox and we couldn't even sell out before the season started. I would never remember a year where we had a manager say how great Fidel Castro is, which is the definition of cancel culture in Miami. No, I, I don't even remember any of that happening. I would never remember the knowledge that we had to trade Burley and Reyes and Josh Johnson and John Buck, who we also had, and, and you and me and the ball boy and the scoreboard man to the Toronto Blue Jays. I don't remember doing any of that stuff. Mm, right, right, right. <laughs> I'm sorry that I reminded you and I brought it up, but damn. But And then you had the reality show. Actually, I know the executive producer. His name is Michael Tolan that did that for you guys. I know him well. Yeah. He and I got along great. He's a great guy, sweetheart. He did the last dance, too. Yes, he did. He, he loved our story. Uh, the, the show was not as successful as it could have been because we had some internal politics going on. Mm -hmm. We had some issues with screen time happening, but uh, Mike Tolan, David Nevins, and I had some good laughs about the franchise, a season with the Miami Marlins in 2012. Well, you know, I, I mean, yes, shit happens. I, I get it. it. It hurts a lot. Talk to me about... The Tino Martinez incident. <laughs> You're really unbelievable. Oh, come All on. All these now. things that happen. How long is this show? Listen, this show's Tino going Martinez. until Tino. Okay, so what was the story with Tino? I mean, come on. He tells, pick up the baseballs. You hit, you pick. What's He's so hard a about that? Belligerent, um, angry, anger management laden person who was given the job by Jeffrey because Jeffrey loved Yankees so much. Mm -hmm. And he was a great name but didn't understand, as many people don't, it's super hard to be a coach in Major League Baseball because you're dealing with rich, entitled kids who are worse than you are. If you were a good player, it's really hard to be a good manager or a good coach. It really is. If you go look at the NBA or MLB, talk about Joe Torre. Good player, won an MVP, but Pat Riley, fine player. The majority of the coaches, Phil Jackson, sixth man, good player, but not Magic Johnson, couldn't coach. Larry Bird couldn't coach. Isaiah Thomas couldn't coach. Barry Bonds can't coach. It just doesn't work because they see the game differently and they don't understand why players don't see it the way they see it. 
They don't understand why players can't do the things they can do. So there's just such a level of frustration for Tino that it just totally blew up. And we eventually just had to fire him because, and, and it took a lot. If, if he didn't have a relationship with Jeffrey, A, I wouldn't have hired him, but B, I would have fired him way before we did. So you're telling me Tino had anger management issues? Like, is that what you're saying? I'm just telling you that he did not like, has he been a coach since? I actually don't know the answer to that. Never ask, I'm a lawyer. I am a lawyer and I violated my very rule. Never ask a question you don't know the answer to. I do not know whether Tino Martinez was ever a major league coach again, but I'm gonna bet no, but I'm not gonna Google it because my producer's not here. And if I Google while I'm doing this, that's like walking and chewing gum and that's too many things to do. Okay, so then are you, are you saying the same thing about Barry Bonds? I can guarantee you without Google that Barry Bonds has not been a coach since we let him go. No, no, I'm talking yes, about right. like, was he a good batting instructor? I mean, no, guys like, Absolutely no. not. Terrible. He had some moments with some of our good hitters like Stanton, who looking back from a nostalgic standpoint says, oh, he was helpful because it's cool to be around Barry Bonds. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong, he's Barry frickin' Bonds. Yeah. But in terms of being a good tactical hitting coach that you need, the best hitting coaches are guys you've never heard of. I'll tell you who was the best hitting instructor that I feel like. His name is Rudy Jaramillo. Very good. That very, guy very good. was a stud. Very, very good. That guy... Good for you. Was he a Hall of Fame player? I can't remember. I, I should Google so. that. No, no, no. no. Yeah. But, no, but here's the thing. I just feel like, I guess, the guys that were average players in the league, not, not too big, not superstars, were the guys that were great coaches, right? Don't you think? But that's how, that's what I'm saying. That's how it works. Hey, were we recording when we just went through the Phil Jacksons, the Joe Torres? Yeah, That's what we were just yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, I know, I know. I'm just like, you know, I'm trying to fit in. I'm trying to fit in. <laughs> all right, so let me ask you this. Whose idea was it to sign Stanton for all that money? Mine. <laughs> okay. Do, do, you, I mean, do you want to know how it worked? Yeah, how did it work? So you, let's lock him, lock him up for 13 years or 12 years? We had a reputation that everybody, that the Marlins were a farm system for everybody else, that we were always trading away our best players, and we wanted Stanton to be on our Mount Rushmore. We wanted Stanton to go into the Hall of Fame as a Marlin. So I went up to Giancarlo, myself. He had just, he had been hit in the face, as you recall. He had not come back after being hit in the face in Milwaukee. Hadn't played. Didn't know whether he could play. What I did know is he didn't like being in Miami. He didn't like playing for the Marlins. Wanted to win more. Didn't like the way we were operated. Just was unhappy in terms of on the field. Off the field, Miami's amazing. Well, of course. So I said to G, I said, listen, I just got a question, just between us. We're gonna negotiate with you and we're gonna have a meeting with agents and we're gonna bring Jeffrey and Mike Hill and I, we're Dan Jennings, we're all gonna be there. What's the number? Like, what's it gonna take so there's no chance that you can say no? He said, oh, I, I don't think you're gonna get there. I said, all right. We're gonna have a meeting. We're flying to LA to meet with him because he wasn't gonna to come to us. We go to the Beverly Hills Hotel. We're meeting, he's with his agent who's the best agent I've come across and that doesn't mean he's the tallest midget. Joel Wolf is actually a great man and a great agent and there aren't a lot of them, but he is one. And we're, we're talking and they're, at, they're interviewing us basically and that bothered me. I didn't want them interviewing us asking about how the team was gonna be, asking us whether or not we'd have room to put players around Giancarlo. Like Manny Machado, when he signed with the Padres, said, I only signed with the Padres because they have a good farm system. Whatever, dude, you signed with the Padres because they're the only ones who offered you 300 million over 10 years. They hit your number, you signed. That's how it really works. But players don't wanna be looked at as money hungry, which we all are. So what they do is they make up some other stuff. So Stan's asking all these questions. I pull him aside. And we walk out of the suite where we were. And I said, hey, G, this is wasting all of our time. We're gonna make you an offer that you can't refuse. And I prepared Jeffrey. I said, you know what? We're gonna have to go over $300 million. We're gonna have to make him the highest paid player of all time because that's the only way he's gonna say yes. And if we do that, I promise you, he will say yes. And I didn't know at the time, but it's what I thought. So I take Giancarlo out of the room and I said, all right, no more. We're going to offer you $325 million over 13 million, over 13 years. 
And he looked at me and he said, you are? I said, gee, you can't say no to that. You haven't had an at bat since you got hit in the face. You don't know whether you can still hit a fastball. You don't know whether you're gonna be scared of the ball. You don't know what's gonna to happen to your knee, your back, your tuchus, your head, your eye, your shoulder. You don't know anything. We are giving you $325 million. Might we suck? Yeah. Might we win? Yeah. Might you be traded? Oh, you wanna know trade clause? We don't give those, G. Don't ask me for that. We don't do it. We can't do that. He said, David, 325, 13, no trade clause. We walk out of here with a deal. I go back into Jeffrey and Larry and I say, listen, we don't have a choice here. This is what it's gonna be, or it was Mike Hill at the time. And we gave it to him. And that is the only no trade clause we ever gave in my whole career on a multi-year deal was to Giancarlo Stanton. And that's how that deal got done. Wow, holy shit. That's amazing. That's an amazing story. And then under Jeter, he got rid of him. So what, what Jeter did, they had, we knew when, when we sold the team to Jeter, <coughs> excuse me, we knew that they were going to trade Stanton because when you buy a team, you have to submit your projections to the league. So I had seen what the Marlins projections were, and I knew that with where their payroll was going, they couldn't have Stanton on the team. But I also knew Stanton had a no trade clause. Mike Hill did an unbelievable job of getting Stanton to where he wanted to go. He wouldn't go to the Cardinals. He wouldn't go to the Giants, ironically. He would go to the Yankees and the Dodgers. That was it. And Mike Hill got a deal done. Wow. Talk to me about Mattingly. What, what made, how'd you guys hire Mattingly? I mean, he's, he's the best. Look, I'm even wearing his 19. Look, look, look at this. See the 1984 top shirt right there? Oh, God, I love that. See I that? love that. See, that's my hey, idol, baby. I'll make a tender offer for that shirt right now. What size? You are a size small? Size large. You know, oh, I got I got a little muscle, you know what I mean? I, I don't need a night shirt. So uh, Jeffrey had said to us in 2016, uh, I'm trying to remember who our manager was in 15. It may have been Mike Redman. Yeah, Redmond, I think it was. And he wanted to move on from Redmond, and he wanted to bring in uh, Mattingly. Mattingly was with the Dodgers, and the Dodgers didn't want to keep him. As you recall, he had brought them to the playoffs, but they didn't win. Right. And Andrew Friedman was there, and Andrew Friedman was new to the Dodgers, and he didn't want Mattingly. So we negotiated that Mattingly would get fired from the Dodgers and hired by the Marlins. And Mattingly couldn't have been nicer. We interviewed him. We knew he was getting the job. Mattingly knew he was getting the job. So it was not a real interview. It was a getting to know you session. And he and I, I can't say this. I can't say this. Cut that. I can't say that Don and I still are in touch. Cannot because then he'll get fired by Jeter. So I don't speak to Don anymore, mm -hmm. ever. I'm totally out of touch with him. He doesn't talk to me anymore. But he and his family are so wonderful. I'm so happy that Preston Mattingly just got a job with the... Phillies or the Padres with a P team running player development. Uh, Donnie has a, a little boy who's now growing up named Louie and his wife, Lori is so yeah, wonderful. Man. He is, I would sit in rooms with Donnie before and after games thinking to myself, I'm pinching myself. I am working with Don fricking Mattingly. Legend. It was, uh, I was never starstruck with any players over the course of my 18 year career. But in the beginning, I was with Donnie. And then we just ended up companions. But in the beginning, I was like, what am I doing here in the room with Don Mattingly? You know, I met him through Manny. And uh, we were on the field, City Field. And I imitated his swing. And, I, and I'll send you the video, the text video. You Did you do his crouch? Yeah, crouch. I used to do, you know, the, the, this with the, yeah. with the, I mean, yeah. he's, and we talked for like 10 more minutes, man. I was like, good for you. you. He's are. such a good guy. Such a mensch. I feel Humble. so badly because, but for his back injury, he's in Cooperstown. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. You know, uh, and he's, he just, he's so humble, man. He doesn't let success get to his head. He's so nice to people. And I'm like, wow, man. I, 
the best feeling when I met him and I imitated his swing. And he was like, yeah, that's me. That's exactly like me. I was like, listen, you had numerous batting stances, but I'm going to pick the prime one. <laughs> you know, with the elbow he used to do. And then he crouched down and hit that shot to the upper deck in Yankee Stadium, in the old stadium. And I was like, man. But the crazy thing is two weeks later, uh, one of the sports agents down in Florida, my good friend Phil, he's like, hey, Skip. Two weeks ago, you guys were in New York, and some guy imitated your swing. He's like, oh, Eddie Mata? I love that guy. I was like, oh, shit. He mentioned my name. He was like, yeah. So That's, I, pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I actually, um, when Donnie got the COVID this year, I um, DM'd his wife, Lori, and I said, hey, I'm just checking up. How's Donnie doing? Oh, he's a bulldog. Everything's fine. Don't worry. He's doing good. You know, I was like, all right, thank God. He's like, he just misses the field. He is a baseball Attic, like this guy loves the game so much. There was a story. I, you remember that catcher? Was it Dave Val? I met Dave. Uh, Dave Val. I don't know. He was a catcher for the Mariners back then. Dave Valley, like V A L L E. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, sorry, Dave Valley. Yeah. yeah, and um, I don't know how to pronounce his name either, but I didn't. Yeah. Whatever. Yes. So he he said that when he would face Randy Johnson, he'll take the first pitch and he'll look at Dave Valley and go, "I love this shit." You know, Randy throwing 98 and nasty ass slider, and he ripped him, man. He, he ripped him, but yeah, that was, you know, Manly. I mean, he's a legend. But you know what, what hurts me the most, man? Oh my God. David, I'm sorry I'm reminding you of this, but is this the reason why you're. Look at the picture right now. Is this the reason why your stepfather sold the team after his uh, death? You know, it's funny. I was just going to talk about this because. Uh, you're making me sad a little bit because I'm, I'm very sad. Donnie, it was me, Mike Hill and Don Mattingly who, and Martin Prado, really. Um, we were front and center that day when Jose died. See, that's the and picture right yeah, there. That there we are. Conference. It, um, I, uh, I, 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 I have nothing to add to that photo, so I'm not going to. All right. Um, I'm sorry, but I, when I, when I heard that, I was in acting school, the conservatory, and my teacher says, Eddie, did you hear about Jose Fernandez? I'm like, yeah, and I had tears, man. I literally, I said, how can this guy be gone? He was so important to the Marlins. He had a daughter, a baby girl. It's like, what is this, when his girl gets older, what is she going to say? You know, like it, that, I mean, you got my daddy, my daddy wasn't perfect, but boy, do I wish I had a chance to have him as a daddy. Yeah. And my daddy made a lot of people smile, changed a lot of people's lives, saved my grandmother's life, made it so I could have a life. And tragedy is not a word to describe what happens when three people die young, which is what happened that day, September 25th, 2016. And it is something, I'm looking at a picture of him right now that I keep up. And I, uh, but for him dying, Jeffrey never would have sold the Marlins. So everyone's life would have been different. But once that happened, he was like a son to Jeffrey. And Jeffrey just couldn't deal with the heartbreak and the, and the sorrow and the sadness and the anger. And life's not fair. And, you know, Carpe diem. You have to seize the day. You have to live your life. You have to not waste time. And maybe that's why people think I'm a whirling dervish. Maybe that's why people think, oh my God, does he ever have an off button? And the answer is no. I don't sleep a lot, a couple hours a night. And you know why? It's not like I, I struggle getting out of bed in the morning. I can't wait to get out of bed in the morning because right now, the only commodity I can't earn or buy is time. And it's the only thing I want more of. And in order to do that, you have to not sleep. And so I'm, I'm okay with not sleeping because it can all get taken away like that. My sister passed away two months ago at 56 of cancer. I'm so and sorry, David. She, it's horrible to lose a sibling, someone who knows your history. Something just happened last night where I was talking to my mother about something from our childhood and I had a different recollection than she did and I realized that there's no one to ask anymore because my father is dead and my sister is, and it was us four when we were very, very young before all the divorces, and there's no one to ask. 
So I'll never know what, what is true about what we were talking about. And uh, you can be healthy one minute and you hear stories and then you're not. So please don't waste a minute, take advantage of everything you can. And this goes full circle to when the show started, which is you wanna know why I don't take no for an answer? Because why would I do that when there's an opportunity to get a yes, when there's opportunity to achieve and accomplish and do more and see more and travel more and have more experiences? Why would you not do that? This is no dress rehearsal, Eddie. This is it. You're an actor. You know, there's no rehearsal at all. No. This is it. You're live. One time. That's it. Dave, I, I totally agree because... You know, every day I wake up in the morning, I say to myself, I thank the Lord for my organs working. I thank everything that I'm healthy because, yes, I, you know, one of my great friends, you know, Chadwick Bozeman, Black Panther actor, my next door neighbor in L.A. when I was living, you know, we were tight. You know, he got the movie uh, 42. He knocked on my window. Hey, man, uh, take out your glove, man. I got some great news. I'm like. You suck in baseball. Why? He goes, no, I need your expertise, man. I'm like, I'm playing Jackie Roberts. I'm like, what? He's like, look, look at the email. I was like, oh, shit. Okay, because, you know, I play college baseball down in Florida, Palm Beach Atlantic University. I had a scholarship there. So, you know, I was the man back in the days. (laughs) I like it. Yeah, but, you know, it's like when you have such a close friend like that, you know, at 43 years old, colon cancer. And the crazy thing is, I don't want to get nasty, but he died on my birthday. And that morning, I had a colonoscopy taken just because I'm 45 last year. I'm like, all right, let me see if I'm healthy, you know, making sure. Then I got the news later that day, and I'm like, no, it's impossible. It is impossible. So I could see how you went through with Jose and your sister. Listen, if you live long enough, you're going to live through tragedy. And it's going to hit every one of us. We're all going to join clubs we don't want to be a part of. The club where your parents died, that club. Mm -hmm. Everyone becomes a member of that if you're lucky, believe it or not. And it's a terrible club. And so the question is, what do you do? There's some people who just curl up into a ball and wait for it all to go away. There's some people who keep running and running and running because they don't want a time or anything to catch up to them. There's some people who will change their appearance and do plastic surgery trying to hang on to the youth thinking that, some sort of changes that way can stop time. I'm different. I totally embrace the fact that time is passing. I'm 53 years old. I'm in the back nine, but man, I got eight holes left, maybe seven holes. You can change your, I don't golf, so this is a ridiculous analogy, but you can change your whole life, right, in the last seven holes. So let's say I've got 40 years of craziness left. 40 years ago was my, I was, Oh, oh, you know what I was doing 40 years ago? What were you doing? Right now, I was being bar mitzvahed. Oh. What's, what I've done since my bar mitzvah to today, if I've got that left, oh my God, that's awesome. That means I got a lot to do. I got to go, man. Eddie, I got to go. I got shit to do. Hold on a minute. I love you, David. Don't go anywhere. You're pumping me up, all right? Come on now. You, you always make time for Eddie Mata, all right? That's the bottom line. Tell me the story. You and Manny Colon at Philadelphia, Philadelphia, in an elevator, and some guy, he sees Manny's credential, and you're right next to him with your kid, I think. Correct. And the guy says, you're with the Marlins organization? He's like, yeah. And the the fan's like, man, fuck that guy, David Sampson. He sucks the president and all that shit. You're literally right there. He doesn't know that you're right next to Manny. So tell me what happened with that story. Um, that's the story. So Philadelphia, there's in most stadiums, we would take the elevator up to the press box because I would often sit at the press level in a, in a suite on the press level. Sometimes I'd sit down on the field, depending on where the, the game was or what the, the importance of the game. Sometimes I wanted the view from on top. Sometimes I wanted to be near the dugout. It depended. Philadelphia, I never wanted to sit in the stands in Philadelphia because the fans there, it's just, it's too much. But it's a it's nice stadium. Was it was is a Citizen Bank? Is that what it's called? I like Citizens Bank. I don't know if it's called that anymore, but it's fine. But uh, we're you're in an elevator. It's a pretty big elevator, mm-hmm. and it's pretty crowded. And there are you know eight people there, and I'm small. 
and I don't have my credential in a place that can be seen because I don't want people to see my credential. Because right. at that point, I had not been on Survivor yet. My face wasn't very recognizable. And people knew my name more than my face, much different, more different than it is today. At least in Miami, very recognizable by face, but around the country, not as much, obviously. Cut to uh, Manny's with me and I'm with my child. And uh, this person is so rude, so viscerally angry when he sees Marlins and starts talking about me. And Manny is sort of frozen, but he looks at me and I give him the look like, and the look was this, it was, don't say anything. Like I'm good, it's totally fine. Mm -hmm. And because it was a teaching moment for me with my children. And I tried to do that so often with them when they would read bad things about me or when people would take advantage of them because of who their father was and try to get free tickets or try to get memorabilia. And I tried to teach them hard lessons that you have to teach, which is sticks and stones, man. They may break your bones, but names will never hurt me. Don't be impacted what people say. And I think it's helped my kids and it certainly helped me in this era of social media. If you don't have a thick skin, you can't be on social media. If you don't have a thick skin, you can't be in the public eye. If you can't handle rejection, you can't be an actor or an executive or in business. You've got to learn how to fail. You've got to learn that not everybody will love you or appreciate you or know you because they don't know you or appreciate you or love you. And you have to be okay with that. And not everyone is. David, how come you're not a motivational speaker? I mean, you like you're pumping me up. Like I feel like you know what I feel like right now. I feel like it's a national college football game in January, and they're coming out of a tunnel. But before the tunnel, the coach is motivating the shit out of you, and you are just fired up. That's what I feel like right now. I, uh, I when you asked me to do this show, I told you that we'd have fun. I told you we'd have some laughs. Oh yeah. And I told you that it may even be entertaining to your audience because. I'm passionate about all the things I talk about and think about and experiences I've had. I'm happy to share my failures because my failures basically have informed all of my successes. I'm not delusional about how I got to where I got to and what I've done to stay there. I'm not delusional about anything and I'm happy to talk about it all. I talk about my anxiety. I talk about nepotism. I talk about height. I talk about weight. I talk about anorexia. I talk about you know, self-indulgence, egomaniacism, narcissism. Whatever you want to talk about, I'm willing to talk about because I think about these things all the time. But you're human. That's what, that's what, you're human. That's what they, they teach us in acting school, at the conservatory. Be human. Humans go through a lot of shit. Uh, too many people in the public eye are not willing to be anything other than perfect. And they're not willing to let anyone see. That's why do you think filters were invented on social media? because people demanded to be anything other than what they are. Why do you think men's Grecian formula is in existence? Or why do you think plastic surgery exists? It's because people don't want to be who they are. They want to be who people think they should be or who they think they should be. I don't wanna waste time with any of that. I am what I am and I, I love what I love. I hate what I hate. And if I can make a bit of a difference on this path, where I'm merely holding the baton for anywhere between 53 and now 95 or 110 years, that's what I'm going to do. So, so what's the secret of looking good at 53 like you are right there? I mean, you got the good skin, the good hair, the good built. I mean, you, you know, you're going well, my man. Yeah, my man. I don't exercise. <laughs> I don't exercise. I drink. I smoke. I don't sleep. <laughs> I do drugs. And... Uh, you know what the, you know what really is the key and what it's funny it? but it's Happiness. the only thing that matters. It's jeans. That's true. And I don't mean Levi's. But hold on. It's but hold on. Jeans. You you love the look at the screen right now. You love that. I I'm a candy addict by the way. And you love this addict. And you love this when things are not going your way. <laughs> no. First of all, I don't drink when I'm despondent. Mm. That I'm not I don't drink alone. Okay. I don't drink when I'm despondent. I enjoy drinking whenever I want to, um, oh. but I don't do it as a crutch. Uh, candy is an addiction. I have an addictive personality. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, what happened? Your computer died? 
I, I, I set my computer that it, it was going to explode like Mission Impossible after 70 minutes with you oh. because I thought it would be 60 and now it's been 102. So my computer exploded. Well, you, you know what it is? I mean, it's such a great interview. I, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? But look, listen, this, it, it's, you've been awesome. You've been great. You talked about everything. You're a great guy. I don't know how people say, oh, Samson this, this and that. I, I don't believe it anymore. I Maybe got they know. haven't met me. They haven't met you. Now, here's my next question, okay? Since you're a movie buff, I'm going to give you a trivia question. You might know it. You might not, okay? There are three actors, when they were struggling in New York City, the combination of three of them, the combination of three of them were nominated for 16 Oscars. They were, all three of them were roommates in New York City. Can you name those, at least name one actor. But those three were roommates in New York City when they were struggling. And the combination of Oscars, the total number is 16 to 18. I think it's 16. Could it be Pacino and De Niro? Were no. they roommates? No. Could it be Philip Seymour Hoffman? No. It's not Meryl Streep. No. Three men. Three men and a little lady. Give me one and I'll get one. Oh, he's in the movie The Godfather. So and are you what? talking about Andy Garcia or are you talking about Marlon Brando? Not Andy Garcia. We're talking about... Hey, Al Pacino? No. He was in The Godfather. He was actually in the movie The Natural, too. The not guy. Robert Redford, not Wilford Brimley. Who else was in The Natural? That was a not Danny Pino. No. <laughs> um, you've got me. Robert Duvall was one of them. Oh, Tender Mercies and all the other great movies he was in. So Robert Duvall, could he? Is he the same age as Gene Hackman? Holy shit! That's two. Wow. Okay. Okay, so you gave me one and I got one. Now we need someone else in that age range. The rubber match, could, baby. The rubber match. Can you win this series? Go ahead. I don't believe it's going to be Clint Eastwood, but that's the age range. But it could be um, another 85-year-old. You know him. I'm telling you, you know of him. Of course I do. Gene Hackman. Wow. I was impressed with Gene Hackman. That was the hardest one, by the way. Robert Duvall. Give me one movie. That, that the third one was in. The Graduate. Not, is Dustin Hoffman that age? Yeah. No. Yeah. Is Dustin Hoffman in his 80s? Yeah. No, he's not. Don't say that. He's late 70s or 80s. It has to be, yeah. Tootsie is in his 80s? <laughs> Three of them were what roommates. Say. Roommates. There were nobodies back then. Nobody. I love it. One of my favorite movies of all time is Stranger Than fiction which dust dustin hoffman is in that people forget his role in that movie as a matter of fact in my house i have one of the props from stranger than fiction i have will ferrell's gown that he wore at the end in the hospital after being run over by the bus oh wow <laughs> look at you well let me ask you this what else is your second favorite all-time film as far as sports sports film which one would you say it doesn't have to be baseball it could be anything no i know I loved it. My favorite basketball movie is Fast Break with Gabe Kaplan. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And I love that. My favorite baseball movie, I don't care what anyone says, is Field of Dreams because I cry every time because all I want to do is have a catch with my dad. Mm -hmm. And all I want is my, for my son to want to have a catch with me. Eight Men Out is an incredible movie if you haven't seen it about baseball. Just incredible. Uh, other sports movies. The Natural? Those are... I love The Natural, of course. I loved it. Uh, I, I I enjoyed I enjoyed For Love of the Game, but it's it's minor leagues compared to Field of Dreams to me and Eight Men Out. I enjoy uh, The Longest Yard, but I don't know that I would consider that a sports movie. But I really love the original of that. Mm -hmm. There's so many great movies. I'm a huge movie guy. You know, I watch a movie every single day. Oh, well, what'd you watch yesterday? <laughs> it's funny you ask. <laughs> Welcome to Collinwood. Mm, 
Okay. That's a Sam Rockwell movie that I never heard of, that I, that I didn't even realize was directed in, by the Russo brothers. And people on Twitter said, watch it, because they know I watch a movie every day. And I watched um, uh, Queen Pins from Paramount Plus that I reviewed today on Nothing Personal. Amazon Prime, did you watch the movie Sound of Metal? Loved it. You know, and, I, and by the way, Coda for me is the best movie so far this year. Although Free Guy was pretty phenomenal as well, but Sound of Metal for me was the best movie of the year last year, and I wish it had done better in the Oscars. You know, I interviewed that guy Paul Racy. That's amazing. You know what? When I saw the film in January, I said, "I'm I can't get Riz Ahmed, but I'm going to get that guy." And guess what? I told him in my interview. In January, you will be nominated for an Oscar. You will see. He goes, oh, come on, Eddie. I'm like, you'll see. March came. He texts me. Him and his wife says, God damn, Eddie. <laughs> he was spot so, on. So, Eddie, Eddie, I don't like your attitude. You can get Riz Ahmed. You want to get him? Go get him. I'm trying. Listen, Dave, I am a fucking nobody, okay? I have a scripted show called Who the Hell is Eddie Mata? After 50 guests, it is on. They just want to pitch because this is a spinoff from this show. Because people are saying, how are you getting all these stars? Well, I'm just like you. I'm after them. I say, listen, you will love me. I guarantee you. This is how I catch them on Twitter. Out of 46 guests, nine of them on my own. Okay, I knew them personally. But the rest, I go on Twitter. Hey, you would love me. You should be on my show. I send them a mini clip. Dan Schulman, ESPN. Eddie, I would love to DM me back, right? I got um, Dan Schulman, the ESPN. I got, um, who else? Uh... Who else do I have as far as the ESPN? Oh, what's his name at night? ESPN LA. God. Neil Everett. I got, I get these guys. I got Ned Coletti, former GM. You know, I'm like, listen, you're going to love me. Look, here it is. You know, I like this guy. Yeah, let's do it. You know, they, I got Vincent D'Onofrio, Full Metal Jacket. Right through Twitter. Dominic Lombardozzi, The Wire, the um, Ray Donovan, you know, TV guys. I get these guys. So that's how I do Keep it. Keep going, Eddie. Uh, that's how I'm doing it. But listen, don't go anywhere. Please watch this podcast. Name of your podcast again? Nothing Personal with David Sampson. Wherever you get your podcasts, we're on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. It's Nothing Personal with David Sampson, the YouTube channel. Every day, five days a week, 45 minutes a day. It's just me breaking down stories, giving you insights into things that you're probably not getting insights from anywhere else. Nothing Personal. That's with David Sampson. Remember that.